<laughs> okay, hi. So um, as Takolo said, I'm uh, based in Wellington at the School of Government at Victoria University Wellington, and I'm also, also at uh, Motu Research, which is a uh, research institute in, in, in Wellington. Um, and Susie Kerr asked me to talk about uh, national measures of sustainable economic progress. What kind of measures can we use to, uh, to gauge a country's progress? And the question I have, and coming from New Zealand, of course, we always bring things back to the Lord of the Rings, um, is, you know, do we have one indicator that can rule them all? Uh, is, um, uh, is there one single indicator that we can look at that tells us both about societal well-being and about uh, sustainability uh, of that well-being? So what would we want to be looking for in a measure of sustainable economic progress? Uh, well, ideally, we would want to be having a measure that looks at uh, people's overall well-being, what Arthur Pigou and the founder of welfare economics called total welfare, uh, as opposed to economic welfare, which is sort of a much narrower concept. Uh, so we would want to be measuring people's total welfare. Uh, we'd want to be making sure that that was environmentally sustainable. And we'd also want to make sure that it's sustainable in all other aspects as well, um, fiscal sustainability, social sustainability, et cetera. So there's a, it's a very tall task uh, to ask a, a one single measure to um, measure all of these uh, things to measure sustainable economic progress. Okay, my slides have stuck. Uh, just bear with me here. I'll just see what I can do on this. Um, Hmm. Okay, so what if, if we think about uh, the standard sort of old economics way of looking at uh, a country's progress in some sense, often we used GDP, gross domestic product, uh, in constant dollar terms, obviously, and per capita, uh, and uh, thinking about how that might be used as a well-being proxy. Uh, it sums the market value of production, um, but it doesn't uh, take into account a lot of other factors. Uh, and it ignores whether the income that is generated from a country accrues to domestic or foreign residents. Uh, it ignores the depreciation of physical capital, uh, which has always seemed an extraordinary oversight to me for economists to ignore that. Uh, it ignores the depletion of natural capital. Uh, it accounts non-beneficial market production, such as pollution cleanup in, in the, as a, a contribution to GDP. It doesn't include uh, beneficial production, non-market production, such as childcare uh, in, the, uh, in the measure. Uh, it doesn't look at changes to human and social capital. Uh, it ignores the demographics of a country, such as the age structure, and of course, it ignores distributional issues. And for these reasons, the founders of GDP never thought of it as a measure of well-being, and Kuznets was very clear uh, that that was the case. Uh, So, sorry, I'm still having trouble with my slides. Um, one of the, um, as I mentioned, Arthur Pigou was the sort of founder of welfare economics. And even before GDP was invented, uh, he came up with this quip about measures of national, uh, the national economy, where he said, if a man marries his housekeeper or his cook, the national dividend is diminished, essentially because market production has gone down and been replaced by non-market production. Uh, so, um, you know, clearly not uh, a good measure. So what other national accounts measures could we look at? Uh, well, one is uh, gross national income, uh, which now we use, you know, commonly in, in the OECD or World Bank or IMF rather than GDP, uh, where uh, this uh, corrects for the country of residents of who, who lives where, because uh, it looks at the income accruing to local residents rather than to the um, rather than the production. So that's one slight benefit. We can then correct for physical capital depreciation uh, using net national income, which takes off depreciation of physical capital. And then the World Bank uh, calculates a measure called adjusted net national income, which corrects also for the depletion of natural capital, uh, or at least some elements of natural capital. So at least those go, the adjusted net national income goes some way to meeting some of the problems of uh, GDP but it still leaves many issues un unaddressed. And uh, so a number of economists and also politicians have said, well, what other measures can we use other than national accounts measures? And interestingly, uh, I come from a country where we have a center-left government that is um, championing well-being. 
But here's a centre-right Prime Minister of the UK, uh, David Cameron, saying wealth is about so much more than pounds or euros or dollars can ever measure. It's time we admitted that there's more to life than money, and it's time we focused not just on GDP, but on GWB, general well-being. So this is um, very much, uh, if you like, a cross um, ideological uh, um, cause, uh, thinking about issues of well-being as opposed to um, measures purely of production or income. There are two main approaches to thinking about well-being uh, in economics these days, uh, but neither of them explicitly includes environmental sustainability. And I just want to talk very briefly about the uh, about these two two measures, two two approaches. One is the capabilities approach, championed by Amartya Sen, also Martha Nussbaum, um, where the whole sort of idea of this approach is that policy should be designed to improve people's capabilities, uh, essentially what an, an economist would call their opportunity set, um, so that they can then pursue whatever. Uh, what Sen calls their whatever functionings they want, uh, in other words, whatever they want to do with their life. And the important thing for, for them is to make sure that they've got the capability to make choices later in life, uh, throughout their life, which includes freedom, human rights, etc., as well as basics like health and education. And the multi-dimensional poverty approach, which is used in, um, uh, in development economics, uh, is related to this approach, as is the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and if you think it back to old debates, um, this is very similar to the idea of equality of opportunity, as opposed to equality of outcome or, or thinking about outcomes. It's very much thinking that people should have equal opportunity to pursue their lives. The other main approach in the literature these days is, uh, if I can just minimize that, hang on, for some reason that's... Right, the other... Um, the other main approach to uh, well-being in the, in the modern literature is the subjective well-being approach. Uh, down below there, you see Dick Easterlin, who was um, perhaps the first economist to really start emphasizing this, this area in the 1970s. Carol Graham's another uh, strong proponent of it, many others um, throughout the world, especially in, in the UK. Uh, and one can think of this as being a modern form of utilitarian philosophy, Bentham, Mill, etc where the idea is that policymakers should be designing policies to maximize uh, the well-being um, across society, where well-being can be thought of as uh, or measured by subjective well-being, questions on how people rate their overall life, which we call evaluative well-being. Uh, and we can think of that as being an indicator of utility, the closest measure that we have of utility. It's not a perfect measure, but it's an indicator. And you'll see a typical evaluative uh, life satisfaction question there um, being all things considered how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days turns out these measures which I use a lot in my own work um, are very strong predictors of things like migration um, they're very uh, useful um, also as uh, in cost uh, cost benefit analysis what we now call cost well-being analysis so for instance in the UK the green book which is the um, bible on cost benefit analysis from the treasury uh, uses uh, these measures to, um, to measure the um, across different policy outcomes. Uh, so subjective well-being measures such as this are now taking sort of center stage in many uh, policy contexts, uh, especially in the UK, uh, to some extent in Europe. Um, there's some champions in, in Canada, uh, New Zealand um, and, and others, and certainly some groups in, in the US as well, although it's less uh, I'd have to say it's, it's less uh, followed in, in the US, um, although people like Dan Benjamin and, and others, Carol Graham, Dick Eastland, et cetera, um, are strongly supportive of it, uh, Jeffrey Sachs as well. One of the uh, key um, documents that uh, got us, I suppose, that brought this, these materials into prominence was the report by Stiglitz, Sen and Fatusi uh, in 2009, interestingly, again, commissioned by a centre-right president, President Sarkozy of France, uh, to look at um, ways to uh, look at the limits of GDP and to recommend other forms and measures of economic and social progress. And I'll just pick out two of their recommendations there. One is to measure both objective and subjective well-being, so subjective well-being of the kind of measure that I just talked about, uh, life satisfaction, 
uh, but also objective measures such as health outcomes, uh, education outcomes, etc. But they said also we need to be looking out in terms of sustainability, taking especially account of environmental tipping points. And I'll contrast this approach of the concentrating on tipping points with approaches that concent concentrate on natural capital, uh, which I think are much less useful in, in some ways, although still, still useful. How do we think about these, um, these areas uh, as a whole? Well, I'll, um, in my, in my uh, slides, which my um, uh, commentators didn't, haven't seen the, the added slide, which I've got at the end on some references, but uh, two, two economists, Delhi and Kroll, uh, wrote a very nice article um, about eight years ago uh, on think, how do we think about different um, aggregate measures of uh, sustainable well-being. And they divided uh, the measures up into three different groups. One group is what they called healing GDP. And these are taking GDP as a, as a base measure and then uh, making some changes to it uh, <coughs> to, to get around some of the issues that are highlighted before, such as the counting of pollution and the ignoring of non-market goods, et cetera. So I'll give you an example of that, but there are a number of different examples. Then there's a second strategy, which they talk about complementing GDP, which is to have GDP or GNI, whichever one wants to use from the national accounts, but then adding other um, dashboard uh, elements to it um, on health, education, uh, housing, whatever. And then there's a third approach, which they uh, refer to as replacing GDP, which is not to use GDP as a measure of, of outcomes, but instead of uh, instead using some other measure entirely. And you'll see the intermediate box there where they include subjective well-being. If there's a cross, that means that those measures don't include subjective well-being. If there's a tick, that means that the measures on the right do include subjective well-being uh, of the type that I've just mentioned. So healing GDP, complementing GDP, or replacing GDP. And here's an example of healing GDP, probably the first measure from Nordhaus and Tobin, 1972. So this research goes back, what, 50 years or so now, um, where their measure of economic wealth, of measure of economic welfare, uh, essentially took GDP, added in leisure time as a, as a non-market um, uh, value, uh, added in the value of unpaid work, um, which is obviously very important, and then took off some estimate of environmental damage. Uh, so that was the first attempt at looking at healing GDP. It addressed a limited number of the issues which are highlighted at the start, um, but not all of them. So it's a very much a first attempt. There are many other attempts as well. Um, and one I just want to mention are the genuine progress indicators, which you may have uh, come across. Uh, these are incredibly arbitrary. Uh, they seem to take off um, different uh, elements of GDP depending on the particular hobby horse of the person who compiles them. Uh, in Australia, I saw one where it took off the value of salt flats that have been lost, um, but no other country does that. And then every sort of city G GPI that you see, genuine progress indicator that you see, um, uh, whatever, they, they just seem to take off all sorts of arbitrary things. So they're not very useful in, in my view. <clears throat> if we look at complementing GDP, perhaps the most famous um, area here has been led by the OECD, their Better Life Index, uh, which is out of their House Life Framework, where they have 11 different domains or dimensions, here they call them, of current well-being. So you see those on the top left, income and wealth, right through to civil engagement. Um, and then they can look at those in terms of the average level for the, for the uh, country or inequalities, um, certain thresholds, such as, you know, to get across, which is deprivations. Um, this is a very odd mixture of, uh, it's a jumble, um, to, be, to be honest. It has 10 objective measures or 10 sets of objective measures, and then they include subjective well-being as a separate measure, even though all of these other things contribute to subjective well-being. So in my view, this, this is an um, incoherent jumble of uh, well-being indicators. Nevertheless, it's still very useful to use for cross-country comparisons in each of those areas. And then they also say, okay, but this needs to be sustainable. So we need four areas um, of sustainability, which they call capitals. Uh, so we have natural capital, economic capital, human capital, and social capital, which underpin future well-being. 
But there are some problems with measuring some of these things. I mean, we're used to measuring economic capital, physical capital, stock, et cetera. Human capital, we can measure to some extent through skills and, and knowledge. Uh, social capital, we have some measures of in terms of trust. And then there's natural capital measures. But natural capital measures are often, uh, in my view, quite incoherent if, they, if they're used at a national level. Uh, and I'll give you an example here. This is another OECD table uh, where, it's, where these are um, across different countries. Uh, freshwater abstractions um, per, you know, uh, for, per person uh, in each country. But what does it mean? You know, some parts of a country are going to be dry. Some parts of a country are going to be wet. Um, some countries have huge rainfall. Some countries have very low rainfall. Um, how on earth do you aggregate uh, across a country in terms of freshwater abstractions when you have wet and dry parts? Um, why should you think about comparing um, freshwater abstractions from a wet country from then relative to a dry country? Um, the aggregation of these things across a country and then comparison across countries really doesn't make much sense in my view. Some parts of natural capital, I think, can be measured sensibly, such as um, uh, issues that contribute globally um, or even nationally, such as forest cover um, for greenhouse gas uh, issues. Um, but uh, many other areas uh, such, as, such as this, I think, just don't make any sense at all. Another um, complementing GDP approach pretty much is the Sustainable Development Goals. Again, a jumble of 17 different, different areas, um, which uh, really have no, not much coherence to them, in my view. Uh, and the problem with these different dashboard approaches, uh, whether it's the SDGs or the Better Life Index, is how do we weight across these different components? Um, so what I've done uh, in the next three slides is to take the Better Life Index from the OECD, very nicely, the OECD allows you to play with their index and put different weights on different areas, such as income or housing or education, et cetera. Uh, and I've used three different weightings. And if you look at these three different weightings, and one of them, the USA ranks sixth, and another one, it ranks 17th, and another one, it ranks first. Uh, so in the first one, what I've got is the, um, the 11 domains of the Better Life Index, excluding life satisfaction, so excluding subjective well-being. So this is the 10 objective domains. And if you look at that, you can see the USA uh, is sixth, um, Norway is at the top. If you look at just life satisfaction only, in other words, just how, how satisfied people are overall with their lives, the USA comes out as 16th uh, on, on that. In other words, people in the USA aren't that satisfied with their lives relative to other developed countries. If you look at um, just putting weights on three elements of this, income, health, and education, and I've chosen those three because that's the three areas that the Human Development Index um, weight, then the USA comes out top. So what do you do with one of these dashboard measures? Do you say the USA is first, sixth, sixth, first, you know, sixth, sixteenth or something? Uh, it doesn't really make much, much, uh, doesn't help you to really gauge the um, overall uh, well-being of a country. Uh, so we have the HDI, um, which is uh, very much reflects what I just talked about. Three key dimensions of life. This is the UNDP's Human Development Index, um, looking at a long and healthy life, access to knowledge, and a decent standard of living. Um, one then has sort of guideposts on that, measured from zero to one, zero being the lowest, one being sort of an aspirational level at the top. Uh, and then you can, you can measure the Human Development Index. But as I show that, that's only three different elements out of the Better Life Index. And so um, why would you want to concentrate just on those three? Uh, you can also use the UNDP's multidimensional poverty in index as well, which uh, looks at um, lower thresholds for some of those areas. But neither of these include sustainability measures. They don't tell us how sustainable human development is, even if we believed what the index uh, is telling us. And that's just, I'll leave that um, uh, note there. Uh, hopefully, if you can get my slides later on, you can look at their, the URL there for how they calculate it. Other groups have put out other dashboard measures. Legatum, which is a large NGO or, um, in, based in the UK, uh, has um, put out a prosperity index based on nine pillars. And you'll see they're quite similar in some senses to uh, the Better Life Index, but includes things like personal freedom uh, in there as well. Uh, but the difference th of their index is that they weight these pillars according to their estimated contribution to overall life satisfaction. So at least there's some um, rationale for the way that they've chosen these things. And if you look at their index, um, the USA in this case comes out 18th. Um, Norway again top. Norway almost always comes out top. Uh, <laughs> pretty close to top anyway. Uh, 
a completely different approach. This is the replacing GDP approach now. Um, says, okay, let's just ignore GDP entirely. And let's just look at uh, people's overall life satisfaction, sometimes called happiness, but more, more sensibly called life satisfaction. And here's one that's been um, compiled by Ruth Veenhoven. Uh, that should be V-E-E-N rather than V-E-N-N. -N. Um, and Ruth is a Dutch sociologist, works very closely with, um, or debates very closely, I should say, with people like Dick Eastland, economists, and uh, Ed Dina, psychologists uh, in this field. And he's constructed what he called a happiness adjusted life year, which is using the same idea as a quality adjusted life year or a disability adjusted life year being health economics measures. And uh, a HALI, a health uh, happiness adjusted life year is just equal to life expectancy at birth for a country times the average happiness in that country where that's been converted to a zero to one scale. Um, so uh, in other words, if life expectancy is 60 years and the average uh, life satisfaction score in a country is six out of 10 on the um, on one of those standard measures, uh, then a happiness adjusted life years in that country would be 36, okay, 60 times 0.6. In the last two years or so, um, the UK, a number of UK economists uh, have um, Paul Freiters and um, Richard Layard and Jan Emanuel Deneuve and, and others uh, have come up with the idea of well-bees, which are well-being uh, years. Uh, which is a very similar concept to happiness adjusted life years, where we measure the effects of uh, policies based on how much they improve overall life satisfaction uh, for uh, people. And then we compare that with overall life satisfaction uh, of people in that country. And that's now used, as I said, in the Green Book in the UK, the uh, Treasury's Cost Benefit Manual. Uh, it's also being used um, increasingly in, in, in New Zealand and elsewhere as well. So these are the sort of modern replacements of GDP. But they still don't account for distribution and they don't account for sustainability. One measure that does account for sustainability is the Happy Planet Index from the New Economics Foundation, which takes Wienhoven's Halley's idea, happy, happiness adjusted life years, and divides it by economic foot, uh, by ecological footprint, uh, EF. And uh, basically it's saying how many happiness adjusted life years do you get um, you know, for your use of the, of the planet's uh, natural resources. Um, to, to believe this measure, you have to have placed some measure on uh, some um, confidence on the ecological footprint as being the main, main measure. And um, I guess that's a pretty contentious uh, assertion. If we were to do this, then you would see that uh, according to the Happy Planet Index, Mexico comes second in the world and Sweden 61st. Uh, now, for anybody to think about that as being a reliable measure of sustainable well-being, I think is pretty far-fetched, in, in my view, but other people might have a different view on that. So this gets us to the topic of intergenerational well-being. We all know the Brundtland definition of sustainability meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. But how does that, how do we actually um, apply that? Um, how do we know that these GDP trends, which are um, sourced from the OECD, uh, a very nice document called How Is Life? Um, uh, how do we know that some of these trends are sustainable and, or, or whether or not they're sustainable? So the most rigorous approach to this is um, the paper by uh, Kenneth Arrow and Partha Descripta and others um, in uh, uh, Environment and Development Economics. Um, which is quite critical of the Brundtland definition. As I say, it makes no mention of human well-being, um, and it makes very weak demands on intergenerational justice. And they argue, and I would agree, that economic development should be evaluated in terms of its contribution to intergenerational well-being. And so they want to look at whether a, uh, an economic path um, is such is sustainable in the sense that intergenerational well-being doesn't decline over time. And what they demonstrate in their paper. Uh, is that intergenerational well-being won't decline over time, provided comprehensive wealth doesn't decline. So they measure, uh, uh, take a measure of comprehensive wealth, which includes um, typical physical capital, human capital, natural capital, um, look at population, look at knowledge capital and institutions, and use shadow prices reflecting scarcity and the marginal value of each of those assets to well-being. Uh, and then they also look at comprehensive investment, which is just the change in comprehensive wealth. Um, and in applying that, um, there are many problems. One is actually measuring some of these things. What are the volume? What's the volume of human capital, for instance? 
uh, and also what shadow price should we should we use? And they are very very difficult uh, issues, especially the latter one, because uh, the shadow price of an asset is going to depend on its stock, and that goes right back to hoteling. Um, it's going to depend on the stocks of all other assets, and it's going to it's going to depend on the degree of substitutability of assets, and in this case, in terms of those their contributions to well-being. So this is a very difficult task to to implement this approach. Um, and this comes back to some of the debates between strong and weak sustainability. Strong sustainability basically argues for no substitutability between capital stocks, especially between natural capital and other stocks, which is an extraordinarily extreme assumption. But then the weak sustainability idea assumes perfect substitutability, which is also an extreme assumption. Uh, so um, I think, you know, we've again, this comes shows how difficult it is to implement some of these approaches. What's the degree of substitutability of different stocks? Uh, and then how do we aggregate um, using the um, changing shadow price, uh, those different stocks. So there have been attempts to measure comprehensive investment, in other words, the change in comprehensive wealth. This is also known as measuring genuine savings, which is just a, a synonym. Uh, and in that paper by Arrow and Descupta et al., um, they actually measured comprehensive investment for five countries and found that uh, development has actually been sustainable, uh, according to their calculations in USA, China, and India. Um, in Brazil, it was right on the edge, but just sustainable and not sustainable in Venezuela. Uh, so there was a sort of a bit of good news uh, in that. And taking this account, this approach further, the World Bank um, compiles measures of what they call adjusted net savings, which is essentially just another term for genuine savings or comprehensive investment. Uh, but it's based on a perfect substitutability assumption. So they define adjusted net savings as uh, the gross national savings from the national accounts, uh, minus depreciation of fixed capital, um, plus uh, current non-fixed capital expenditure, such as education expenditure, which is assumed to lead to an increase in human capital, take away rents from natural resources and damages from carbon dioxide and particulate matter um, emissions, and then take that as a ratio of GNI. So you can get that, you can download that from the World Bank's website. Uh, for virtually every country, and um, for some countries that goes back 50 or, or so years. So it's a very nice um, series, but it does rely on this perfect substitutability assumption. And with a PhD student, um, uh, I uh, co-wrote a, a paper, uh, which is just uh, it's been accepted in Environment and Development Economics, yet to appear, it's on the website. Uh, but we um, wanted to test if there was a trade-off between running sustainable policies according to the adjusted net savings measure, is that positive or negative? Uh, and then looked at well being changes in a country over the next decade and next two decades uh, to see whether it was possible to have a win win situation where one could both promote well being at the same time, subjective well being at the same time as running sustainable policies. And we used the adjusted net savings measure of sustainability. We also use just the natural capital component of that from the uh, World Bank data. And we also used ecological footprint as another approach to sustain measuring sustainability. And we also tested whether there was the perfect substitutability assumption within adjusted net savings uh, is, is justified. And essentially our conclusions were um, that a country that tries to uh, increase its uh, sustainability is likely to do so at the expense of current um, well-being, in fact, well-being over the next decade, because essentially it's saving for the future uh, and has less resources, fewer resources for people in the present, uh, and therefore is, is negative for, uh, for the current um, group of people. But then if you look two decades ahead, there's a rebound from the first decade. So in other words, you're, you've been saving, you can use that in two decades time, but there isn't a win-win, at least in the short term which of course is the reason why governments find it very difficult to run sustainable policies. We also um, tested whether the perfect substitutability assumptions in the uh, approach of World Bank uh, hold, and our conclusions were that they didn't hold, that these different forms of capital were not perfectly substitutable. So where does that leave us? Well, um, I think the Arrow Descriptor et al. approach is, is a very nice formal modeling approach. It gives us a way of assessing sustainable well-being. Um, it's the most coherent um, approach that we've that we've seen. Um, 
Other approaches, especially those that rely solely on strong sustainability are incomplete because they ignore, for instance, the growth in human capital, they ignore technological change, they ignore some substitutability, however limited, between assets, and they also ignore that that substitutability changes over time and is different across countries. But I think returning to Stiglitz and Fatusi, um, I think tipping points are a major issue. And this is one, an, an area where uh, I think not enough uh, emphasis is placed in the natural capital literature. Uh, tipping points are essentially can lead to very sharp changes in shadow prices. So there could be highly nonlinear changes in shadow prices as we approach tipping points of certain um, uh, resources. Uh, and these are gonna differ very strongly even across countries, but even within countries. So a simple linear measure of natural capital is unlikely to help us um, either. So coming back to Delhi and Kroll, uh, we've seen that the healing GDP measures are pretty incomplete and often pretty arbitrary. The complementing GDP uh, measures are often uh, pretty much a jumble, uh, such as the Better Life Index. The replacing GDP measures, in my view, are the uh, most promising ones, but most of those have yet to uh, sensibly incorporate uh, sustainability although conceptually the approach of Arrow et al is probably the best way to go there. So in conclusion, essentially no one indicator rules them all. Um, being a well-being economics scholar, I, I would uh, argue for placing a lot of emphasis on subjective well-being uh, as the best measure of current well-being, uh, and then trying to complement that uh, with measures of comprehensive investment or comprehensive wealth but acknowledging that these uh, different resources are not perfectly substitutable to then try and measure whether our well-being uh, that we're seeing is sustainable. And I'll leave it at that um, and uh, stop sharing my screen Oops. and leave it to the commentators to take over. And everyone's muted. Thank you, at the Arthur. <laughs> Who's the boss here? How are we going to do this? Well, I, I don't know. One of us starts, I guess. Well, okay, I'll, I'll S go comes before T. So why doesn't Spencer start? <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Arthur. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Great. Um, Yeah, I just thought that was a, an excellent summary of sustainable economic pro progress, the, the extent of the, the work that is out there, the, the different approaches, how each one can get at something different, how they all have strengths and weaknesses. I've never seen um, such a useful overview as yours, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to, you know, I'll keep my comments brief, but I want to come in maybe by giving um, some defense of the, the healing GDP approach relative, not saying that it's perfect, but relative to some of the other ones you talked about. So you made the comment, Arthur, that um, GDP was never intended as a measure of well-being, and you mentioned Simon Kuznets there. And of course, you also mentioned um, Pagu at various points in your, your talk. And um, I disagree with that. And um, it's not beyond me just to be merely pedantic, but I, I'm actually going, I do have a point, a, a bigger point here. Um, certainly that is something that Kuznets claimed. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kuznets was one of the major architects of GDP um, working in the United States at, at the MBER. Um, his approach was perhaps extremely um, pragmatic and smart politically for someone who was trying to get a new index number into government um, that had not been there before. He did not want to overclaim. Um, but he was also taking an approach that was very um, um, representative of what the NBER did generally. Um, for example, they were accused by many other economists of doing measurement without theory. Um, they said the same thing about measures of inflation, for example, that measures of inflation are not measures of the cost of living. They're just averages of price change. Well, I don't know. I think they are measures of the cost of living and everyone else thinks so too. So. Uh, Kuznets took it a very extreme view, is all I'm saying. Um, Pagu had a different view. He talked about the national dividend um, in his books, and he was extending the, the marginal revolution. I know you know this, but I'm, I'm speaking to some of the, the others here. He was extending the marginal revolution in economics from the late 1800s 
where one of the, the key insights of that work there in the last, say, quarter of the 19th century was that market prices for final goods and services are equal to people's marginal willingness to pay for those goods or services. And Pagu talked about that as being their marginal value as measured by the measuring rod of money. So it's value in dollar terms, and so we can interpret the price there. And GDP, of course, aggregates or weights various goods by those prices, and so therefore by, by marginal values. Um, that's how it combines apples and oranges. Literally, that would otherwise be different. It looks at the relative prices. So if you look at the bottom here, um, can you see my little hand if I wave it around? OK, so here on the, the left of this equation, here's a, here is a, this is GDP. This is um, the, the zeros and ones and the superscripts here are, are, are year zero and year one or before after a change and the Qs are quantities of goods and services um, consumed and we're summing up over those goods and services, I, apples and oranges, weighted by constant prices. You could choose different constant prices, but a standard way to do it is to use baseline year zero prices here. And so the upstairs is the same as the downstairs, except we have a new quantity. And so we can think of that new quantity as the old quantity plus the change in quantity. And this cancels the downstairs, you have one, and then you've just weighted the change in output by its price. That price is interpreted as, as marginal value in a, in a welfare sense according to Pigou and many other economists. So it's what we say, it's a first order approximation to a change in welfare in, in, as a proportionate change in percentage terms. So I think that leaves the groundwork, that leaves the door open for trying to heal GDP in other ways for other things that we have value for that aren't priced in markets. And so Pigou talked about um, a series of paradoxes, situations where there are both priced goods that we can put in GDP, or what he called the national dividend back then before Kuznets' work, and unpriced goods, both of which are important, and in some cases even identical. So I wanna um, take the quote that Arthur gave us and extend it a little bit. The full quote reads like this, the services rendered by women enter into the dividend when they are rendered in exchanges for wages, whether in the factory or the home by the maids but they do not enter into it when they are rendered by mothers and wives gratuitously to their own families. The, and here's the famous part. Thus, if a man marries his housekeeper or his cook, the national dividend is diminished. These things are paradoxes. And just a sentence or two later, he continues, it is a paradox, lastly, that the frequent desecration of natural beauty through the hunt for coal or gold must, on our definition, leave the national dividend intact. So the, the desecration doesn't reduce it. Though if it had been practicable, as it is in some, some exceptional circumstances, to make a charge for viewing scenery, it would not have done so. In other words, it would have decreased, that desecration would have decreased GDP. And then Pugu then goes into a discussion of um, what, when is it possible to assign a P to a good and when is it not? And so um, as that passage kind of suggests, there's um, been a lot of work along the healing GDP lines, both from feminist economists like uh, Nancy Fulbray and Julie Nelson and others um, to bring in traditional women's work and other non-market work um, to heal GDP that way. And that looks very much like a lot of green uh, GDP work. And I think Arthur would agree with that. That's um, implicit in some of the work he cited. Um, so anyway, I, I think that approach can um, be linked to um, a kind of welfare, a kind of welfare that's associated with the choices people make. And in that case, the private choices people are making that determine the prices in the market. In my own talk um, in, I forget, January or February, sometime in the winter, um, I'm going to talk about that as well as the possibility of looking at social choices in addition to private choices when we think about a choice-based approach to some of these indexes. There are, of course, other ways of doing it, as, as Arthur made um, quite clear, and those have their own paradoxes. Um, philosophers have asked for millennia what happiness means, what well-being means. Is it a sort of Benthamite utilitarian pleasure minus pain, a, a, something based in sensation? Is it an affect, 
an emotional state of feeling happy or feeling well? Is it uh, something more Aristotelian or Thomistic, looking at um, human flourishing, excelling in what humans are able to do, what makes us unique in terms of being able to be virtuous and to act rationally? Um, and you know, Aristotle says you wouldn't even know that until you could look back at the end of your life. So very different ways of thinking about happiness and well-being. They're not necessarily consistent with each other. They're not necessarily consistent with environmental sustainability. So we could imagine a world where um, the world is going to hell environmentally or all sorts of ways, and yet um, we're excelling ourselves individually, individually and um, in, in fighting against that, perhaps. Um, and, and so that individual is, is happy. Um, so paradoxes for those as well. So I think in the end, I will come to uh, Arthur's uh, conclusion and agree with it. Um, we could say no one indicator rules them all or uh, let a hundred flowers bloom. I don't know which one has a better or worse connotation. They both have, are problematic um, that way. Um, but I, I agree with the, the sentiment in this case. Um, Arthur, maybe I'll tee this up as a question to you. At one point when you were talking about the dashboard approach, if I heard you correctly, and I might not have, but I think you said, well, they, you know, there was the one, the OECD one that gives three different rankings for the US from one, six, 16, I think it was. And so what do we learn? We don't learn anything from that. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not sure if you really meant that quite as literally as I heard it, but I would say, well, if you ask a different question, you get a different answer. And all these different kinds of indicators are associated with slightly different questions. And they may all be interesting questions in their own right. And that's why no one rules them all. So thank you again. Very nice, very um, interesting and, and, and thought provoking. So uh, do you want to answer or should I give a few comments first? give some comments and first I'll I'll start by saying hi to I, I noted a lot of um, a lot of my friends in among the attendees are listening here so just uh, saying hi to you it's nice to uh, be back at PDF even if it's um, virtual um I think I'll start with the um, uh, also perhaps with the in a sense of healing uh, CDP of course the the one the one really big uh, uh, thing that is wrong with CDP, the, the, the biggest one, I think, is the G. It is a gross value. And um, and so this is really big. And um, Hicks has this nice definition of, of, um, of income, which is what you can consume during a year. And still, at the end of the year, be as well off and have the same prospects as at the beginning of the year. It's very much like the Brunton definition. In fact, I, I assume that Brunton probably borrowed from Hicks, but I, I don't know. Um, and um, uh, so if you have, uh, like at the individual level, if you've inherited the stamp collection and you sell it and then you drink beer for a year, that money, that wasn't really income because at the end of the year, you don't have the inheritance you had. So this is a, this is pretty obvious uh, that we ought to deduct um, uh, depreciation, basically. And you mentioned it, but but uh, I think it's worth uh, spending a little more time on, on on that particular thing. That it would be very much better if we were speaking about a net um, net national income net. Uh, domestic product, uh, net something else, and the more adjusted the net it is, the better. But let's start with the net, first of all, because, because this is such a no-brainer point. I think it's important to, to explain to people uh, the reason why. So net uh, domestic product would be a big step in the better direction. Why don't we use it? When? <laughs> The embarrassing and simple answer is we don't know what it is. And we don't 
it would require uh, deducing, uh, um, deducting the wear and tear of road building machines from GDP. We don't know how, how big they are exactly. We do know kind of on average how long a building stands, uh, but we don't know exactly technological changes can make technologies, buildings, entire cities obsolete and, and depopulate them, and then depreciation will be faster than you expected. Like old uh, titles, they kind of lost a lot of value when computers came along. And, and so um, we don't know how big the depreciation of physical capital is, and it's important to set that point to sink in. Because it means that we really don't have much of a handle on, on income. And if we don't know how, how big the depreciation of roads and, and buildings are for machines, just imagine how little we know about the depreciation of the uh, biodiversity, bio-integrity of the planet, or ecosystems, or, or something more complex and subtle. And um, so th there's a related point. I mean, that, that's really the first point I, I want to say. Um, we don't even know the depreciation of, of, um, of machines left much less our own health and the health of our ecosystems. Um, so it's a really difficult task. There's a, another point I wanted to make. There's a, there's a sort of a similar debate on resource efficiency, um, the, the Millennium Development Goals, for instance. Uh, someone asked me, which I regret somewhat having said yes to, but to, to write about the Millennium Development Goal 8.4 about resource efficiency and circularity and stuff. And there's a whole sort of debate that is very, very similar to this one, where people measure um, resource efficiency and enormous resources are put into debates about these things. A lot of firms, countries invest in, in, in saying they have plans for, for these millennium development goals, which are very important. And then there's no measures of them. I mean, there's, well, how do you measure efficiency, resource efficiency? Well, there's something called the sort of the gross, the domestic material footprint or something, which is the kilos of, of stuff that we use. And so that's, I mean, it's a similar problem, but we're aggregating uh, environmental amount of material we use in tons instead of in money. Um, and it's difficult to do in money because we don't know all the prices, as, as, as was mentioned before. But of course, it's, it's, not, it's not great to do this in tons either, because a ton of gravel isn't the same as a ton of plutonium or, or, or some toxin or, or something else. And we really don't know this. And this applies to area after area, and even to the planetary boundaries and the thresholds that we would like to know and that I agree we would like to know. But for each of these areas we look at, like chemical pollution, uh, there's, now we're, we're hardly, we have a hard time counting the chemicals we have, let alone uh, knowing which is worse than what and how to aggregate them. Uh, we don't know the number of species and we don't really, um, uh, in nowadays, People interested in biodiversity, they think that there's, there's much more interest perhaps in, in the genetic diversity within species than the diversity of species. And even uh, the word species is not properly defined. <laughs> so, so, the, so we have these similar problems of, of aggregation, counting, and, and of course the truth is that a it's a desire for simplicity when we want one index, but the world is multidimensional. And, and so we actually have to carry care about both the number of, of, of trees we cut down, and not just the total number, but the number by species and, and, and where they were standing and, and so forth and what will come instead. And so we need to care about these details and, and aggregate weights will never really get us there. 
The third point I wanted to say something about, and we did a lot of us care a lot about, is, is of course something about fairness and uh, and distribution, and ideally we should. Many of us feel that perhaps the uh, the, the there is a, a welfare improvement uh, of say ten percent for everybody, then the ten percent that and befalls the poorest is somehow much more important or more valuable than the um, um, than the ten percent for the, the richest, and and so there should really be some kind of welfare rates, and uh, I think there are attempts at doing at, at implementing welfare rates. That is, so that's another very difficult area. So that there's, that's, I think that's just. No, I'll leave it there. But uh, thanks. It was, I, I thought it was about to say it was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so um, I think we have a question sort of on, could you possibly give some real world examples of what it would look like to possibly use alternative methods and in different indices? Um, what does that really mean for public policy? Um, in a sort of real world application. Okay, can I give an example to Colo? Um, let's take, um, I think a lot of these issues are actually best thought at a more microeconomic level, uh, uh, even though we started out with macroeconomic indicators. And I'll use the example of health expenditures, uh, where um, the UK. Well, let, let's think about if you're if you're worried mostly about increasing GDP or GNI, and uh, you'd say, how should we allocate health expenditures? We should allocate them to make sure that people who are uh, who are currently not fit for work but maybe could work uh, will make sure that they get back into the into the labour force uh, so that they can contribute to GDP uh, increase incomes. Uh, on the other hand, if we used a subjective well-being measure, we would say, which of these uh, Different health expenditures would most uh, increase the subjective well-being of of people, and the work in the UK shows very clearly that the most important um, contributor to subjective well-being of right across the board is uh, essentially work on depression. If one can overcome depression, uh, that will have the greatest impact on people's subjective well-being, uh, and also it can be dealt with reasonably cost-effectively through CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, for instance. So instead of um, maybe uh, getting people back into the workforce necessarily, one would say, actually, what we really want to do is to treat depression, even of people who are currently in the workforce, because that's going to be the most important thing for improving their well-being. And so it's taking a focus away from what income they can generate, as opposed to what well-being they can generate. And these are the sorts of things that these well-being measures are now being utilised for in current policy debates. Um, okay, great. And Arthur, I just wanted to know, would you like to respond uh, to any of the comments that Thomas and Spencer made before we um, wrap up at the hour? No, I probably agree with them all. You know, <laughs> we need to take distribution into account. We need to, you know, there's no one indicator that rules them all, but we can make attempts at trying to heal GDP. Um, they're not going to be perfect um, and no measure is going to be perfect. And that's the thing. I think we have to just live with that. Um, that situation we have to take both distribution and sustainability into account. Um, and we, we have to be pretty humble about whatever measure we use is gonna be imperfections. Okay, great. And uh, we also have one more question about uh, sort of the, the utility of, of, these, of these measures. Um, and so what would be the best way to, to implement uh, calculating some of these trade-offs would we use one metric would be use a whole bunch of different ones depending on the policy options that we're looking at. Do you want me to comment on that one or the others? <laughs> I can sure. comment. I mean, I, to be quite honest, I don't really care who owns anything. It's it's the ultimate. That's a it's a means to an end. Um, to me, what's important is what the what what the effects of that are on people's well being. And I'll give you one example. Home ownership is one that's very. I've done a lot of work on home ownership. We think home ownership is a good thing often, and especially in Anglo-Saxon countries. But um, why is it a good thing? You know, if, you, if it's uh, not necessarily a good thing, if you've got mental health problems, 
the stress of dealing with the mortgage, etc., can make your well-being worse. Um, so, you know, ownership of, of your own house may be a, a, a bad thing for, you, for your well-being for some people. Uh, I don't, you know, it's, there's, um, there's good reasons why some people own things and other people don't. And I don't have a strong view that one form of ownership is better than another. Others probably have a very different view. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much to, to Arthur and to Thomas and to Spencer um, for participating in this. Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up at the hour. Um, so um, anyone who is on this call that is not with an EDF, uh, you can drop off now um, as we'll be doing a, a private session uh, where we have quite a few questions from some EDFers on the content that you have. So thank you everyone for um, being here. And also we have actually Spencer will be doing the next one um, in January and it's probably going to be on intrinsic value and environmental policy. So uh, look forward to that. We will be advertising that in our newsletter um, as well as sending out invites. So that's gonna be exciting.